Europe, the Southeast, one kingdom, three rulers, their consorts, their heirs, and none of them destined to be happy. And the kingdom? The kingdom was doomed. I was very young when I lost my father, and three years later, we had to bid farewell to favorite places, to many people, some of which I never saw again. And I returned to my homeland after 50 years in exile. This story is the missing page from the common European history book. It has never been told before. During the 1880s, the world was headed in a new direction of rapid industrialization, requiring massive natural resources. The previous decade began the scramble for Africa, the ultimately successful attempt on the part of the major European powers to parcel out the black continent. In order to avoid all-out war with each other, the Europeans decided to gather together and map their respective claims. The resultant Berlin Conference concluded in early 1885. 13 states, including the United States, were in attendance. German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck played host almost exactly six years after the ill-fated Berlin Congress. Ill-fated for Bulgaria, that is. This time, though, Bulgarians were on the cusp of an unimaginable triumph, the unification of their homeland. To Bulgarians, the Berlin Congress was a sharp reversal of historical justice. The borders of their homeland were redrawn without regard for ethnographic realities. The country and its people were separated into two entities, the Principality of Bulgaria and the Autonomous Ottoman Province of Eastern Romalia.
The great powers left over a million Bulgarians and other Christian communities under the continued sovereignty of the Ottoman Sultan. The newly founded Principality of Bulgaria included territories between the Danube River and the Balkan Mountains. Eastern Romalia occupied lands between the southern ridges of that mountain and the Rudopi Range, and east to west from the town of Samakov through Svilingrad all the way to the Stranja Mountain and the Black Sea. All that meant that the young Bulgarian prince, Alexander Battenberg, would never know a moment of peace for the rest of his reign and his life. He would always remember fondly the idyllic moments he spent with Maria in Exinovgrad. Two monarchs would follow in his footsteps and would share in his tragic fate. Ferdinand Saxe-Coburg Gotha and Boris Saxe-Coburg Gotha. Exile, death, oblivion would mark their path too. The idea of unification was conceived in the first hours following the announcement of the Berlin Congress decisions. It would take seven years to come to fruition. In September of 1885, a series of mutinies broke out in various parts of eastern Romalia. Citizens of the Principality offered full support to their brothers across the border. At this critical moment, Prince Alexander was at his brother's wedding to the daughter of Queen Victoria. Russia was categorically opposed to unification, especially under the aegis of an already out of favor prince. On his way back, Alexander met with the Russian foreign minister and assured him that unification was not in the cards. Battenberg knew he had no choice. Either he had to betray his subjects or incense a powerful state like Russia. There were no useful alternatives. The young prince decided he would be no meek puppet to the Russian Tsar, a role assigned to him by the imperial court in St. Petersburg. From that moment on, his cousin, Alexander III, would fall into fits of uncontrollable rage at the mere mention of Battenberg's name. To his aunt, Queen Victoria, however, Bulgaria's beloved prince and favorite of young noble ladies across Europe was but an unjustly persecuted knight in shining armor who stood up to Tsar Alexander's Asiatic barbarism. Consequently, the British Council in Plovdiv, capital of eastern Romalia, supported the cause of unification. The province came to symbolize the hopelessly messed up relations between the great powers. Eastern Romalia came into being in order to limit Russian influence in the Balkans. However, Great Britain supported unification, 
whereas Russia and Germany vehemently opposed it. Otto von Bismarck's overriding concern with the maintenance of the European concert, stage managed and directed by him, of course, proved decisive. The erstwhile chancellor even sabotaged Alexander Battenberg's love for and engagement to Victoria Prussia, granddaughter of Queen Victoria and sister of the future German Kaiser Wilhelm II. On September the 6th, Prince Alexander was in his summer palace of Sandrovo when he received word from Plovdiv. Today, unification was proclaimed across Romalia in the name of your highness. The government has been toppled. Long live the prince. Your loyal subjects, the interim government. Although he was privy to the preparations for unification, the prince was surprised by the speed of developments. He was led by a genuine sense of historical mission and not mere vanity when he took over the leadership. Alexander sensed that unification was a sacred moment for the nation. It was proclaimed in his name, therefore he accepted and supported it. This decision made him a key figure in the Balkans, the ruler of a unified Bulgaria who triumphantly entered Plovdiv. A storm was brewing in the meantime. In order to punish his independent-minded cousin, Emperor Alexander recalled all Russian officers from the country and spoke in favor of unification without Battenberg. Britain too was in favor, but Austria-Hungary incited the Serbs to attack Bulgaria. Without Russian support, the Bulgarian government was too vulnerable. It was inexperienced and immature. The prince was simultaneously elated and desperate. Elation won out and he threw himself into reorganizing and motivating the army. He received and sent off various units, made fiery speeches, talked to the soldiers as one of them. In return, they gave him their unconditional love and proclaimed their readiness to die for him. After attending mass at the cathedral, Alexander went to the mosque where at his insistence, prayers were read for the Sultan in Istanbul. His deed endeared him to the remaining Muslim population of the two Bulgarias. The Bulgarians were already a nation, it seemed, and a united one at that. The National Assembly met at an extraordinary session on September the 10th. Prime Minister Petko Karavelov opened the proceedings. MPs unanimously approved a massive military budget as well as the regular 1886 budget. At the same time, many of them were in two minds about the situation. They were aware of the fact that unification meant open conflict with Russia the Liberator. But while Russia still inspired positive sentiments, attitudes to neighboring Serbia hardened. Bulgaria's sudden expansion was seen in Belgrade as a direct challenge to Serbian interests in the Balkans. War looked inevitable. Vienna, the Schönbrunn Palace, Emperor Franz Joseph's study. He and Foreign Minister Gustav Kalnoki were there when Serbian King Milan I entered. The king announced he intended to attack Bulgaria immediately. The host insisted he show some restraint in order to get a clear grip on the international dimensions of the crisis. 
but he relented to only five days grace. The off-season led many politicians to suspect Russian involvement in the unification of Bulgaria. Russia had only recently avoided coming to blows with Britain over conflicting interests in Central Asia. Bismarck's Germany was too powerful for almost everyone. It had humiliated Russia and Italy at the Berlin Congress. Germany and Britain maintained a sort of frigid coalition in order to ward off Russia. On September the 9th, Alexander Battenberg notified the great powers by wire from Plovdiv. Old Eastern Romalia is no more, and the people have declared me their prince. I vouch for the peace of both sides and for the safety of people irrespective of their race and religion. I appeal to the governments of the great powers to recognize this situation and plead with you to argue the case of unification with His Majesty the Sultan, whose approval of the fact will contribute towards avoiding unnecessary bloodshed. This is necessary, as people are ready to defend the de facto state with their blood. The great powers in the Ottoman Empire continued to vacillate. Bulgaria was in breach of all manner of international agreements concluded at the Berlin Congress. That kind of behavior was the equivalent to hooliganism, but some appeared willing to overlook it. These considerations did not apply to King Milan. Serbia insisted on being compensated with key Bulgarian towns. The Bulgarians refused. The Serbian-Bulgarian War began on November the 14th, 1885. Prince Alexander Battenberg assumed overall command of the Bulgarian forces. A series of defensive formations were erected along the Sofia Niche Road and played a decisive role in determining the outcome. The war gained notoriety under the captain's beating generals, Monkir. For after Russia pulled out its commanders, Bulgaria's only hope rested with around 40 young officers, most of them recent graduates of the Sofia Military Academy. Facing them were many experienced warriors, including a number of generals who had participated in two wars. The Serbian army had been generously funded by the Austro-Hungarians and was armed with the latest hardware. But the captains could rely on a truly priceless asset, the indomitable spirit of their soldiers. Battenberg issued a manifesto calling for every Bulgarian capable of bearing arms to gather under the standards in defense of their homeland and freedom and fight off the invaders. The response was overwhelming. Even schoolboys turned up. Unbeknownst to the Serbs, the Bulgarian army fielded more artillery pieces than anticipated, while many soldiers had invaluable battlefield experience fighting in the Russo-Turkish War of Liberation. Commander-in-Chief Battenberg himself was a veteran of that conflict. The war lasted a mere two weeks with a Bulgarian offensive deep into the Serbian territory. King Milan appealed to his great power patrons to stop the Bulgarians. Austria-Hungary threatened Battenberg with military action, so Bulgaria was forced to the negotiating table. Despite achieving a huge victory, it gained no territory. The one positive outcome of the war was preserving unification. Less than 10 years after its rebirth, Bulgaria became a key political factor in the region. But in the Balkans, nothing is ever as easy as it looks.
less than a year after his triumph, the prince was far from basking in glory. His cousin, Alexander III, was humiliated and used all of his diplomatic clout to exact revenge. Strategically speaking, unification was not a major obstacle to Russia's geopolitical ambitions. Bulgaria was an orthodox country where the Cyrillic alphabet originated, a script common to both nations. Bulgarian Russophiles considerably outnumbered their kin in Serbia. Russia's Balkan pet, which on top of all else was under Austrian-Hungarian patronage. The real reason for the Russian emperor's feelings was his personal hatred for his cousin and namesake. The Tsar simply could not swallow Battenberg's impunity. One August night, a band of Russophile army officers organized a coup d'etat. They were being spurred on by the Russian diplomatic agent in Sofia. The atmosphere in Sofia was heavy. Printed propaganda was rife. Alexander has embraced the goddamn Austrians and desired to lay waste to the Balkans. Our fatherland is destined to oblivion should he remain on the throne. Let us be rid of him. In a surprise move, the 1st Alexandrian Regiment was disarmed and the palace was rapidly encircled. Major Petr Gruev, followed by officers Benderev and Dmitriev, stormed inside with drawn sabers. Gunshots and artillery volleys shook the building. Alexander ran down the dark corridor to the servant stairs and onto the conservatory for a closer look at what was happening. He heard shouts, down with the prince. He was immediately surrounded by armed people. Amid flashing bayonets, someone thrust a piece of paper into his hands and barked an order for him to sign the abdication. Alexander asked for a cigarette and after a few draws said, had I known of even one soldier of this army who thought my abdication necessary, I would have left myself. Major Gruev, on Monday you had an audience with me. Why didn't you mention any of this then? Captain Rodko Dmitriev was incensed and raised his voice. This is for the good of the people. Russia wants this. Sign the papers without delay. The first freely elected prince of Bulgaria, after 500 years of foreign rule, uttered, God save my Bulgarians, and turned in his abdication. Murders, robbers, with these words I trample the law underfoot. Away then, with human sympathies and mercy. I no longer have a father, no longer have affections. Come, come! Oh, I will recreate myself with some most fearful vengeance. After they forced him to sign the abdication papers inside the palace, the plotters escorted Battenberg to a yacht and sent him to the Russian emperor. However, the newly liberated and unified Bulgarians exhibited surprisingly mature attitudes to statehood. In the absence of their prince, they organized a counter coup and brought down the pro-Russian government. The imperial court was forced to maneuver Alexander III offered to allow his hated cousin to return. Great Britain saw an opportunity to advance its interests at Russian expense and lent its support to Battenberg's reinstatement. The prince was inclined to agree. It looked like the great powers were playing childish games but their jostling affected the lives of millions in the present as well as future generations. In the end, Battenberg came to his senses. He understood that his return to the throne would in all likelihood endanger his beloved Bulgaria. 
Battenberg would be the last Bulgarian ruler to personally lead his army into battle. He boarded a steamer up the Danube, never to come back. His last words were, God save Bulgaria. His reign lasted a mere seven years and two months. He was only 29 at the moment of his downfall. Europe's favorite child, as he was known around the old continent's loyal households, had to leave because geopolitics predetermined his fate and because in the course of the critical political situation surrounding unification, he had outlived his usefulness. Battenberg's last act before departure was the appointment of a Council of Regents, an unusual move. In the case of Bulgaria, the Council was tasked with organizing the elections for a third Grand National Assembly, which would then elect a new Bulgarian ruler. Members of Parliament were in disagreement about the main foreign policy issue of the day. Some believed that relations with Russia must improve before a suitable candidate was sought, and others thought it more important to find the right person and then seek to normalize the ever-worsening relations from a position of relative stability. Following Emperor Alexander III's orders, Russian military attaché to Vienna, General Nikolai Kalbars, arrived in Sofia on September 13, 1886. His brief was to pressure the regents and the government to accept Russia's full terms, a full amnesty for the mutineers against Battenberg, and postponement of elections for a Grand National Assembly. The regents accepted the former demand and declined to comply with the latter. Elections were held in the face of pro-Russian opposition, despite armed clashes between the two factions. Relations between the Regency and St. Petersburg had never been worse. It seemed Bulgaria was in danger. The Bulgarian government found a way out of this quandary by convening a Grand National Assembly in some haste, and despite the inevitability of MPs being split right down the middle in their attitude towards Russia. The British idea of bringing back Battenberg was revived, discussed, and shot down by the majority. After a second period of deliberation, the assembly elected to the Bulgarian throne Prince Valdemar, son of the Danish king Christian IX and brother of the Russian Empress Maria. The move represented a partial concession by the Bulgarian side in its attempt to appease the Russians. However, on October 31, 1886, the Danish king relented under pressure from the emperor and declined the offer in lieu of his son. The Ottoman Empire, too, was against Valdemar's appointment. All attempts at appeasing Russia failed. Russian Imperial Navy ships turned up in the Varna harbor. The Ottomans concentrated forces on the Bulgarian border St. Petersburg proposed as their candidate a Georgian prince in Russian service, General Nikolai Mingrelsky. The prince had participated in the capture of Veliko Turnovo and many other battles during the War of Liberation. The Russian offer was rejected unanimously by the regents, ministers, and members of parliament. Great Britain suggested the Swedish prince, Oscar Karl August, instead. It was no accident that the throne speech of the regent referred to an impasse and concluded with an appeal to divine benevolence for all your deeds and undertakings. The Bulgarians played it safe. The MP sent a three-member delegation to the great powers. The aim was to clarify the situation and to ask for advice. High-level audiences were set up in various capitals. During the months of November and December, the delegation consisting of Dr. Konstantin Stoilov, Dmitry Grekov, and Konstantin Haljikalchov visited Vienna, Berlin, London, Paris, Rome, and Istanbul. 
The only exception was St. Petersburg. The Russian ambassador in Vienna said that St. Petersburg recognized neither the National Assembly of Bulgaria nor the legitimacy of the delegation. Vienna, the corner of Kertnerstrasse and Kertner Ring, the neoclassical building of Staatsoper, a staging of Johann Strauss. The Gypsy Baron is about to begin. The younger Strauss is close to the Coburg Palace and the Saxe-Coburg Duchy. Major von der Laba arrives in a resplendent carriage and is met by Konstantin Stoilov. Stoilov is a convinced monarchist and remains loyal to Battenberg, but is also a man of compromise, always at hand to mend fences. He escorts von Laba to the Bulgarian delegation's box. In the course of the conversation, Von Laba puts forward the name of his colleague and friend, Ferdinand Saxe-Coburg Gotha, Lieutenant of the 11th Hussar Regiment of the Austrian Army and Prince by rank. The Major tells the delegates of Ferdinand's provenance and personality. The Prince is a scion of the House of Witten, a family going back to the early days of the Holy Roman Empire and Sigismund I of Luxembourg. In the late Middle Ages, the house was headed by Friedrich the Warlike. In the late 19th century, it recaptured some of its glory thanks to the prominence of the Saxe-Coburg Gotha Duchy. The rise of the duchy dates back to the election of Leopold to the Belgian throne, who married off his sister, Victoria von Saxe-Coburg-Saalfeld, to the Duke of Kent, a union that produced Victoria, future queen of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland and Empress of India. In turn, she married a Saxe-Coburg-Gotha prince, Albert. Leopold's brother Ferdinand married the Hungarian Countess Antonia Kohri. Their firstborn son, also Ferdinand, became prince consort to the Queen of Portugal, Maria de Gloria. His younger brother, August, wed French King Louis Philippe's daughter Clementina. It was to them that Major von Laba's friend, Prince Ferdinand, was born. The prince's father, August, was a major general in the Austrian army and a lieutenant general in the army of Saxony. His mother, the aforementioned Clementina, was the great-granddaughter of Louis XIV. Her grandmother, Maria Carolina's mother, was Austrian Empress Maria Theresa, and her mother, Maria Amalia, the former queen of the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. The would-be king's genealogy even crosses that of his predecessor, Battenberg. Princess Beatrice was the youngest daughter of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert, and was married to Battenberg's brother. Von Laba hinted that he spoke with the consent of Emperor Franz Joseph I, and that Ferdinand's candidature would not be opposed on the contrary, the Viennese court thought it was particularly suitable. The following day, the delegation members met Prince Ferdinand Saxe Coburg Gotha in person at the Coburg Palace.
The Prince's residence was, and is, one of the most remarkable buildings in Vienna. Built between 1840 and 1845 by the Prince's grandfather, the palace sits on a section of the city's walls. The citizens of Vienna affectionately called it the Asparagus Palace because the colonnade at the main entrance reminded them of their favorite vegetable. The Coburg Palace was renowned for its refinement and good taste, and its ballroom was the favorite playground of the Viennese high life for over a century. The delegates sent a cable to the regent, Stefan Stambolov, to share their favorite impression. Russia's renewed attack at the onset of the new year aimed to bring down the region's council. During the 16th to the 19th of September, 1887, at the height of the Viennese ball season, Bulgaria was in the grip of a Russian-inspired officer mutiny. The ringleaders were Majors Atanas Uzunov and Olympi Panov heroes of the Bulgarian-Serb War of 1885. The mutinies were put down quickly and the leaders of the opposition, former Prime Minister and Regent Petko Karavelov among them, were arrested. Mass repressions followed. People were fired, arrested, exiled, and many members of the opposition immigrated. On February the 22nd, the military court sentenced the mutineers to death. The main organizers were executed. Atanas Uzunov had immortalized himself with his spirited defense of the Vidin Fortress during the Serb-Bulgarian War of 1886. In a desperate situation, he was invited by the Serb commander to surrender his position. I was taught to storm fortresses, not surrender them," came Uzunov's reply. He then attacked and reversed the battle. Uzunov was 34, Panov 30, when their own compatriots tried and shot them to death for what at the time looked like high treason. But in hindsight, it is not so clear. On March the 15th, Dr. Konstantin Stoilov embarked on a new mission around Europe. He had been advised by the regent, Stefan Stambolov, not to return without a credible candidate for the throne. After informally approaching the Austro-Hungarian, German, British, and French governments, the regent's council decided in favor of Ferdinand without consulting Russia, a hazardous move in European politics. On July the 7th, 1887, the Grand National Assembly officially elected Prince Ferdinand to the Bulgarian throne. Later, they would write of him. He was sufficiently vain and brave to ascend the throne without Russian approval. Bulgaria finally had a ruler it would never embrace wholeheartedly. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Ferdinand's ambitious mother, Clementina, was granddaughter of Louis Philippe and great-great-granddaughter of the Sun King, Louis XIV. She dreamt that one day her son would be like his illustrious ancestors. What was it that Great Britain, Germany, Belgium, and Bulgaria had in common? They were all ruled with love, fidelity, and perseverance by representatives of the saxe kolberg family, whose marriage strategies had turned out to be extremely successful. Let others fight wars. You, lucky Austria, you get married. Whatever Mars gifts them, Venus will gift to you.
Prince Ferdinand swore allegiance as Bulgarian ruler in August of 1887 at the ceremonial hall of the Grand National Assembly in Veliko Ternovo. His life was a nightmare from day one. No diplomat wanted to greet him. He didn't speak the language and could not communicate with his subjects. He grew dependent on his most influential supporter, Prime Minister Stefan Stumbelwolf. Ferdinand drew the sarcasm of foreign correspondents stationed in Bulgaria. But the 26-year-old prince was not to be outdone so easily. During his visits abroad, he stood next to emperors, kings and presidents as their equal. He could afford to disdainfully brush aside the British ambassador's outstretched hand, and in London at that. Bulgaria's close relationship with Germany did not prevent him from openly sharing his doubts about Kaiser Wilhelm II. He was courteous to some, haughty with others, unusually flattering and crushingly rude. He changed his mind often and without reason, was quarrelsome and had no equal in giving and withdrawing his favor. Ferdinand came from a very old line and it showed. Senhor, coito se sobrou-se também.